Hello again and welcome to Tinfoil Helmets, your occasional spicy hot take roundup of the latest F1 rumors with all the almost believable conspiracy theories to back them up. Everything here has been carefully researched for hours to make sure it's totally founded in logic, reason, truth, or not. Who knows? And uh, Dominic, before we get going, I have two points of note. Uh, one, to the listeners who listen, I am sorry for the air conditioning noise in the background, but it is 108 degrees where I currently am, so that's not going away. And uh, two, I was listening to uh, another podcast about another sport this week, and apparently the average podcast lasts six episodes, so we are well over the average at this point. We are well over the average. That's amazing. What does it mean if we get to 23? Because, no, wait, 24, because we did not Emma. We did uh, do not Emma. So we did not Emma. So we might get to the end. We might, we might quadruple the average. That's a good going. There we go. All right, well, starting off right at the top, do we get anything right from our our silly predictions for Austria? Um, I think I, we, we, the one I have been banging the drum on, and I feel so vindicated, uh, Merck will drop back in Austria, and they did. Uh, you also said Alonso would get his win. He did not, uh, although I uh, we'll get to it later for sure. But uh, Aston, I think, certainly gave it a good try. They did. I did wonder where their pace had been, but I think they predicted they weren't going to be great at this track. If I remember correctly, yeah, I'm a bit surprised at how far Merck dropped back, but I, uh, but Radio Toto was on fire this weekend, and he did make a comment at some point in time of like, "We know the car's crap," and I'm wondering how much, um, yeah, the car's gotten better, the upgrades have gotten better, but I wonder how much one practice session, like, really limited them to actually set up the car well for this sort of race. Uh, I can believe that. Uh, I've got a whole diatribe about this at the end, so uh, we'll, we'll, we'll save it for that. But I think it's I think it's worth an interesting discussion. Uh, Perez disappoints. Perez did disappoint, absolutely, uh, in so many ways. But we'll save that for the race. Uh, world Championship podium again? Uh, no, it was only Max is the only world champion on that podium. Indeed, and do we think any of the others that were on the podium will ever make it to the World Championships? I don't think so. I, I had a question for you, and I forget if I put it in, in the doc, but I think it's... Yes, it, it's in here somewhere, and I think we need to talk about it. Um, or, around future World Champions. Interesting. Okay, so we've recovered that we got anything right, and it was basically two, two out of three? Two, two and a half out... No, one and a half out of three. I'll give it one and a half out of three. We've so. done worse. Uh, we've done worse, uh, so I'll call that pretty good. So... Uh, between race drama, uh, celebrity football team owners secure access to the paddock by buying a stake in a second-rate F1 team. Uh, this was uh, Ryan Reynolds and Rob McKenna something or other uh, have spent uh, a large amount of money as part of a £250 million investment in Alpine. Rob McKinley? Rob McKinley, that's his name. I couldn't pronounce it. I, uh, I I'm questioning. Ba- I feel bad for him because it's always like Ryan Reynolds and that other guy. And he he has valid too. He's amazing. I think really good in uh, Mythic Quest on Apple TV Plus. Uh, top show. Short, quick, funny. Occasionally a little bit misogynistic, but they kind of then come back to that. But that's a sidetrack. Yeah, uh, I had I had a couple questions for you on this. Uh, where does uh, this rank in terms of like buying a fifth tier English football team versus like a second rate F1 team? Uh, I think it is worse than buying the football team because the football team, it's a people problem, right? You don't, you don't have to buy cool boots and fancy other balls that require significant investment. You kind of, you can run the business by training your people. You may have to pay some money to get a new player, but like, it's, it's very easy to make that difference. But they've gone and bought, they've bought Alpine and I'm like, you're just going to have to put more money into it. I'm not saying the team can't get there, but they need more money. It, it'll be very interesting because, uh, did you watch any of the, uh, Welcome to Wrexham, uh, show on FX? I or did Hulu? not. I did not. It's on my to-do list. Uh, it was very well done, um, but they definitely showed that they were willing to spend maybe more than they were originally comfortable with in getting new players into Wrexham. And I'm very curious, uh, you know, how much they're going to be involved in the day-to-day of Alpine. I suspect rather not, um, but it's still, it's, it's very interesting. And I was wondering if we're going to get a, a Welcome to Endstone show out of this. I, I would love that. I would love... Uh for our shared history with respect to Disney, we'll put that to one side. I would actually love to see this on, on, on like Hulu or maybe ESPN. I think there's a lot of legs in a show like that because I think it's the antithesis 
to Drive to Survive because it will go deep for a whole season on one team and it will tell the whole story and it'll have people who know how to tell a story behind it unlike the one that was about McLaren which got cut after three episodes because they decided they were so terrible that year that they cut it. Um, I think there's a good chance this could this could work out. I'm hopeful. I mean, the, uh, the McLaren show even had Michael Douglas narrating it. Did it? It did. I Man, believe. I totally, the, totally The Amazon that. Prime show that was for like six yes. episodes. Yeah, I believe Michael Douglas yeah. was narrating it interesting they paid big for that interesting they, they chose the wrong season well they certainly uh, didn't pay big for the car that season okay so moving on next one uh, apparently alpha tori is going to change its name and copy red bull for next year like copy the car um or aka marco opens up his gob like a narc again i thought this was pretty interesting because i think like why does alpha tori exist anymore right they don't have space for the drivers that they create because max is there until 2028 and they're just going to chew through all the second drivers uh, on top of that, like, how much can they really copy from Red Bull? Like, the regulations are, like, after the pink uh, Mercedes slash the tracing point, there was a lot of rules instigated about, like, much more attention being paid as well as more restrictive rules on what you can try and copy. And I'm really curious what that really looks like. Yeah, I mean, that's gonna that's definitely a good question, I think. But, you know, you think back to the Monaco race where there were three teams that showed us their floors by crashing into walls. Like, it's fully okay to, to take pictures. So I think it's one of those things of as long as you have a chain of custody of why you have this information, um, you know, maybe, uh, maybe this is why Perez put it in the wall in Monaco. It was all three-dimensional chess so that Alpha Tori could see their floor, and then it's like, oh, we're not borrowing information from Red Bull. We 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 saw this like everybody else. I see. I like that line of thinking. That is absolutely believable. Hundred percent. I subscribe to that. Uh, and uh, my favorite news of of the uh, the in between weeks was according to the race, which is not a uh, Daily Mail style publication. Ricardo is on the pace in the simulator. So I have one point to pick with you. The race is maybe not the Daily Mail. But it's not far off. <laughs> um, I did. I saw this too. I thought this was actually pretty interesting, especially all the rumors about getting rid of um, Des- Debris and um, also Perez looking like he's actually not worth the apparently ten million that he's being paid. I thought this was pretty interesting. Um, I need to see him in a car. He needs to get in a car. They need to put him in a car where he can actually drive it. Yeah, I think that. Yeah, it'll be a question to see if that's going to happen. But yeah, I, I think I give the race a little bit more credit than that because, like, it definitely comes. It's the old like. Um, motorsport or auto sport or whatever group right no there used to be a guy whose name i've forgotten who did work for the race until sometime last year and then he switched to race fans or racing news i think it was racing news who is like the daily mail um and so i thought that was pretty interesting except it's like dieter retton whatever his name is he writes these articles that are really good on wherever he's writing but then the rest of the stuff around it is a dumpster fire um maybe we shouldn't be too hard on the daily mail or the race given that we've tried build tried to build this podcast as like we're talking about conspiracy theories and wild accusations but we don't pretend it's real news oh that's true we, we, we understand what we're doing here it's we we say it in the beginning we're very clear with our intentions whereas the daily mail just makes it up and pretends like it's real news at least it's not the sun where it's full of puns uh, yes, but back to back to the story. I, I'm I'm very curious about this. I think this is pretty interesting. Um, there's a comment been made by Mercedes about Mick Schumacher being their, you know, secret person that helps them get their uh, gets their setups on target by doing all the work in the sim. I wonder if Ricardo is helping here and his Red Bull secret thing. Except clearly he's not doing it for Perez. Uh, I don't know. Well, that that's the thing is he actually no. Okay, here we go. Daniel knows Max and what Max likes in a car. He is helping set up that car for Max. Checo can't deal with it. We know Ricardo has the pace from the sim. This is like Ricardo's three-dimensional chess move to get into Prez's seat because he exactly knows. He and Max were teammates for a while. He and Max can clearly drive a similar style of car. He is helping pushing that car in a Max direction, an anti-Checo direction, and it's giving him a way to slide into that seat. I will 100% subscribe to that. He's absolutely spot on. He knows what he's doing and he's pretending like he's helping, but he ain't. He's stabbing him in the back. I mean... Just like Red Bull would do. It's one smiley Australian. You you don't think he has any nefarious uh, plans right there. He's just so happy all the time. Once a Red Bull driver, always a Red Bull driver. Which makes the question, what's Al- who is Albon going to stab in the back to get back into the Red Bull car? I, oh, I, think, I don't think Albon's going to stab anybody in the back. I think he's got a good thing going right now. Yeah, maybe. They said apparently he's been told he has to be more mean and he's trying very hard to be meaner. Uh, we can talk about... I have some thoughts on Albon in the, uh, from the sprint race. We'll talk about that later. Uh, so Charles is starting his talks of an extension with Ferrari. 
uh, is this just not the classic like abusive partner of they won't hurt me again? I, I I don't understand why he would do. Well, actually, I understand why Charles would do it because he is being abused, uh, and that's nothing else that he can do. And it's it's you know it's uh, what's Stockholm syndrome. Uh, the question though is, if you were Carlos Science and your contract was coming up for renewal, maybe you would think about going somewhere else because clearly you're the better driver right now. And they don't like you, and they're treating you like crap. Oh, yeah, we're going to need to talk about that for sure when we get onto the race. But the question that I alluded to at the top of the show, and I want to get at, is what historical driver will we look back at and say, uh, yep, this is the kind of career Charles had? Felipe Massa. I was thinking David Coulthard. I was thinking about historical Ferrari drivers. Oh, I was, I was going to open it up to the whole grid. Historical Ferrari drivers is fine. Yeah, I was going to say Felipe Massa would be the historical Ferrari driver. Because I feel like he's like, everybody thinks he can do it. And he might actually be able to do it, but then he just misses out and then it's all gone. Uh, he's had his 20, 2007 moment, um, not quite the same, last year when he almost could have won the championship, but then Ferrari screwed him. I was thinking a bit like Kimi before he went to Ferrari and won in 2007. Like Kimi the McLaren years. Yes, yes. I, I, I Very seriously, yes, I would agree with that. Is has the it has the same moment around it, although Charles doesn't quite have the don't give a F uh, attitude though. Well, the Kimmy had. few are Kimmy. But that's kind of why I ended up thinking like David Coulthard of somebody who's like there for a race win on the day, has been in the machinery that might be able to win, but win a championship, but just isn't, can't do it. Yeah, can't convert. Yeah, no, I can, I can, I can subscribe to that. Um, yeah, very believable. Uh, I don't think he should sign with Ferrari. I think he should go drive with anybody, literally anybody else. Williams? Yeah, no, he and Albon paired and build the team back up with the help of James Vowles. That'd be a brilliant story. I need the documentary on that. Like three seasons, take the money, accept that he's going to live in England. I should totally do that. Three, like, three seasons that, that, in a movie? That, three seasons in a movie. Uh, yeah, that would be, uh, I think that would be a, a massive like retribution type story uh, for uh, Charles Leclerc, but yeah. he won't do that. Do you think Charles ha- has the ability to build a team back up? I don't know about that. I think that's a very fair point because I think he doesn't, he's not old enough and mature enough and bitter enough. Because you think about the people who have done that. I mean, Lewis had a lot of experience with McLaren before going to Mercedes and Mercedes was already well on the way with Schumacher. Um, Schumacher going to Ferrari from Benetton, that was definitely a thing. Like, it's... I'm, Vettel tried to do it with Ferrari and just utter... And, and Vettel's not a slouch. No, his mistake is he tried to build it from within. He needed to he needed to get the house cleaned out. And honestly, you could argue that Alonso's form is because of Vettel's work last year. Yes. So yeah, it, I, it's I think it's very rare for a driver to be able to do that because you saw like Ricardo tried to go to Renault and help Renault out and didn't go that but, great. But you see, this is this is the mistake. You have to go and believe it, right? You have to be in it to win it, right? I know that sounds very glib, but Ricardo was at Renault for, what, two seasons? Yeah. Two, and, and, like, he gave up and left, right? Like, he went for the money or he went for the team that he thought he could do it. He, If he wants to build a team about it, you're looking at, like, three-plus years to take the time, right? Get to know them, vibe, and then you can start the building process, right? If you look at what Schumacher did at Ferrari, he didn't go to Ferrari and like two years later, they're like, great, it was what, three years of Ferrari of driving around, not knowing how to do it? Like he got close a couple of times and drove into some other people like an idiot. Broke um, his leg. Because he's Michael Schumacher. Exactly. Uh, but yet th- there was that part of that process and the learning and how you get to it. And I like, I don't think Ricardo was prepared to do that at Renault. He'd actually, he he ran away from um, Red Bull. He didn't run towards Renault. Well, to be fair, that last season in the Red Bull he had, I understand. That car was cursed. Yeah, but he was also stuck with Max, and he thought he was better than Max, and he wasn't. I, that I'm was just, his mistake. Since we've gone a bit historical, uh, it wasn't. It was a little bit of in-between race news, but I saw an interview with, I think, Coulthard and Eddie Jordan, and they were talking about how uh, apparently David almost signed with uh, Ferrari and, took, and would have taken Rubens' seat. Interesting. Rubens was the second choice, but the thing was, he didn't. there was a line in the contract of, you will move out of the way for Michael, and he was like, he was just, you know, on the day, I didn't want to be like, okay, cool, like, you have this almost wrapped up, give me a chance to win. He wanted a, he wanted his shot. Like, not that he thought he was ever going to be in front of Michael, but if Michael was going to have issues, he wanted to be able to have a shot at a win. The question there for me is, that did Rubens accept that he was never going to be world champion? 
and therefore he was willing to accept that or or did he make the mistake that i think a lot of people would make which is like oh i'll take this i'll prove how good it is and the next time my contract comes up for renewal i'll get that line taken out well if there's a race we need to talk about it's definitely austria just that would be like what the 2001 or 2002 race I have no idea what happened in that race. That's the one where Rubens was leading, and then uh, they were asking, they essentially uh, told him to pull over and let Michael go by. Ah, uh, right. Everything happens in Austria. Yeah, and if uh, if you watch the Top Gear interview with uh, Rubens and Jeremy, it was like, so how did that go down? Listen, we've got your dog here, and if you don't pull over, we're going to shoot him. And Rubens was like, yeah, I kind of like that. Okay. Uh, Shall we move on to our occasional segment, Does Blank Still Have a Job? I think so, and it's not that occasional when we do it every episode. True, but but who is in the list is occasionally different. That is true. Uh, At the top of the list we have Nick uh, with the comment, certainly not after qualifying, and then I also added, certainly not after the race. I don't understand how this man is stood in the car. He's clearly, clearly not meant to be an F1. I, I think we can almost retire him from this segment because we know nothing's going to happen until the summer break. And it's something that we need to revisit, like, right around, like the first race back of, like, is Nick still in the car? I, 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 yes, but at the same time, I just like discussing how bad he was every week. <laughs> you can you can see the moment in the race this weekend where he had had a talking to about driving more aggressively. Because then he tries to push a bunch of people off the road and pretend like he knows how to drive an F1 car, but he hasn't got it. You know there was that conversation where he's like, no, you're pretty much screwed. You've got maybe one or two more races before, you know, we really sign on the dotted line. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think I can, I can, I can accept re- retiring him from the list until we get to the summer break. So Nick DeVries to NASCAR, where Rubin is racing. <sighs> no, because I don't think he's actually a very good driver. This, this raises a bunch of questions. Like, um, Formula E is the place where bad F1 drivers go to have a career. Now, that's going to be an interesting comment because Antonio Giovinazzi could not drive Formula E to save his life. And I don't necessarily think Giovinazzi was an amazing driver, but clearly he was underrated because he was so bad in Formula E. Um, Like, really, really bad. And I think anybody else who's in Formula E, who's they're either washed up F1 drivers or they're not good enough for F1. Stoffel? Was he any good? He he got Alonso'd pretty hard. Indeed. In a crappy car, which really, at the end of the day, uh, yeah, it got a lot of video. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think Formula E is not the path to go if you want to drive an F1. Don't do it. Which means, what's his name? Felipe Drogovic, who won the F2 title last year. I think it was Drogovic. Uh, or whatever his name is. Uh, Daruvula, sorry. Daruvula has got an F1, F Formula E thing, and I'm like, no, you're never coming to F1, you crap. So, hashtag judgy. Otmar? That's a great question. I think he has entered a very dangerous um, zone of not screwing up, but not getting any better. And I think that's that's almost the most dangerous type of person to be in terms of like when you look at your contract and how well you're going to survive it. Well, if you've watched season one of Welcome to Wrexham, they let the manager uh, end out the first season and then decided he was a crap manager and they decided not to bring him back for the next season of Wrexham football because they bought like close to the end of the season so yeah I think I think Otmar is safe for this season but does he come back for the next season I don't think he does I think I I think we'll find out that he's gone from the team mid-season I think maybe the summer break will be like they'll announce the new one to start at the end of the year sorry the beginning of next season uh but an Otmar will know his time is done is is Otmar going to be? Is it the promoted to a place where you can no longer do no. anything? You th- oh. no, he's going to get fired. Oh, you think they're just going to straight up fire him? Oh, L- Lauren Rossi telling the whole team in public that they're crap and they need to get their act together. He's not going to let Otmar, you know, ascend up the pearly gates to sit around and do nothing. He will be taken out back and bludgeoned while they film it and then they show it on TV. It's clearly that's what's about to happen. Uh, okay, moving on. Uh, Lance, does Lance still have a job? Three stop in his way through Austria to be well out of the points. I, I thought for the first half of the race, I thought maybe he had um, uh, given himself some more time, but then he just kind of slid down the rail. And did you see the clip of him fixing his wrist because it was hurting? Um, now the question is, does his wrist really hurt? Or was he doing that to make sure he's got something to fall back on when he gets home and his dad says, you drove a crappy race, I need to get rid of you and swap you for Charles Leclerc. Or maybe I should swap him for Carl, uh, Carlos Sainz. And he just did that to show, no dad, it's still my wrist. I'll give him a little bit of the benefit of the doubt on the wrist. I mean, 
because if, if he came back from injury really quickly, maybe quicker than he should have, because um, that's the other thing. Maybe somebody else gets in the car in what the first race in Bahrain and goes toe to toe with Alonso. And then then we see what that can be like. And then Lance gets back in the car and it's like, oh, now you really see how yeah. bad Lance is. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. he came back. He came back early to protect his seat. Right. Uh, yeah, I, I'll give Lance a little bit of a pass. I, I still don't think he's worthy of being in that Aston Martin at this point in time, but I'll give him a no, pass. No, I agree. Okay. Uh, Mr. Sargent, apparently there is a rumor that we're going to get Schumer, Schumacher in for Sargent. Uh, I, I don't know whether he did any worse this race, um, but I don't know. Uh, well, the, there was a great joke going around on Twitter that with all the penalties, he was going to end up P1 because, like, he was... Because he was driving so slowly, he was clearly always on the track, so it was fine. So everybody else was going to get, like, two minutes worth of penalties, and he'd be fine. I think he got a penalty. I think he did, too. Yeah. Uh, okay, Ferrari, which I managed to skip over back there. Uh, does Ferrari still have a job? Uh, I'm going to go with, no, they should all be fired, except maybe Fred. I mean, Javi did not do a good job of reading the radar this time. I gave him praise for that in Canada, and he did a terrible job of reading the radar this time around. Without wanting to get into the race, uh, the uh, sciences engineer whose name escapes me, I don't understand what's going on there. But anyway, uh, yeah, I, Ferrari's still screwed up. The, I will say they brought the upgrades seemed to work. The car did seem to go faster. Um, uh, and then last but not least on our list, uh, Perez. Uh, and I think it was I that commented after that qualifying debacle. Hell no. Is he out of contract at the end of the season? I don't know. I haven't... I think he signed a two-year contract last year. Yeah, that was my understanding as well, but there's been a lot of chat about, is Perez out? Is Ricardo going to come in? Are they just going to eat that money? This is, this is Red Bull. A contract means nothing, right? I mean, they will abide by its rules. It's not rules. like McLaren. Well, no. Uh, that was, but that was long and drawn out, and there was a discussion, and they were hugging it out, and they all said it was a loving. Uh, for Red Bull would just, like, revoke your access card and be like, just find $10 million in your bank account and get bent. Um I, I, I don't think a contract makes any difference if you're if you're uh, Red Bull, which is why I think Max has to keep performing. If he fails to perform, Marco will have him out back uh, and get rid of him. Quality recap? Sure. Uh, I did, to be fair, I just watched the highlights because I had other things going on this okay. weekend. Uh, I will say that anybody that does choose to watch it, you should be very careful and do not play it. Take a shot every time somebody says track limits or when somebody has their lap deleted. Um, you could, but you will in fact end up with alcohol poisoning. It was ridiculous. I mean, even if you talk about the race, if you did that with just water, you could end up overhydrated and in a still a very bad state. Exactly. It's ridiculous. We here at uh, Tinfoil was... Helmets do not condone drinking games surrounding track limits at Austria. I agree. I think that if you choose to do that, you did that after our warning and we are not responsible for any issues that may occur. Uh, I, I, the thing that particularly got me, I thought overall the track limits were, were not annoying, but they just confused the whole issue. Um, but the one that really got me was when Perez in Q2, where he got knocked out, um, he came off on T9, right, and got the car straight, and it was great. Like, he was in the right position, and he was pointed in the right direction. And then he turned the wheel and went off the track, and he went off the over the white line as he tried to set himself up for turn 10. I just couldn't believe it. I was watching it. I skipped back to watch it again. And he turns off the track to go over track limits. And I'm like, what are you doing? Um, it's interesting because I, I was like, skip back to see the next time Max went round. Uh, Max actually does the same wiggle. He comes, he comes straight up and then goes wide again. He turns away from the inside of the track to go off it. But he keeps it inside the white line. I thought that was uh, interesting. I then followed up and watched the Ferraris, the Mercs and the Williams. And none of those do the wiggle. So it's like Perez is trying to cop copy max's driving style but he doesn't have the skill to pull it off it was it was like i was just laughing and laughing and laughing because he just like yeah let's just drive off the track when i'm in jeopardy already why would you do that i i do think it was very weird to have like on the sprint weekend the double qualifying because you have like the race qualifying and the sprint qualifying and like it was very interesting in fact in the sense of like the second qual this qualifying for the sprint was like the same but but also different in a sense like, it was a little bit mixed up, but, like, pretty much it was it was almost the same random grade. It's almost like if they're going to do a separate qualifying for sprint, do just, like, a different sort of qualifying altogether. Like, yeah, it has to be different. Yeah, it has to be different. It, it was 
uh, it was very confusing. You've got the whole Friday problem, which we've talked about before, when you can't really watch it, in, especially if you're in a country that has the race happen, has the qualifying happen during the workday. It makes it, it's just weird. It makes sense. So they need to spice it up. They need to do something with it, because otherwise it's just redux. The thing that always got me is I looked at the playback recording, and it was like an hour and a half for qualifying, and then, the, you know, the sprint, sprint race itself is 35 minutes. It's like, this is ridiculous. We've got to fix it. Yeah, if anything, like we talked about maybe the lack of uh, a second free practice session, Give them a second, or make it a practice quality session on Friday for the sprint race, and so you can change set up everything like that. But the fastest time you set in P in free practice two is your qualifying position for the sprint race. So if you want to spend the whole time doing race trim setup, you go for it. But you might start out a position in the sprint race. So, and then Saturday morning you do quality for the race, and then you do the sprint Saturday afternoon, and then you go in Sunday and do the race if you have to keep to that schedule. I absolutely agree. I think something like that. They need, they need to do something. They need to revisit it because um, it's ridiculous. Um, one last comment on quality was every time somebody got told they were over track limits, it was like listening to John McEnroe saying, you cannot be serious. The ball was on the line. Like they were all like, no, I didn't go over. And you watch the replay and you're like, there's about a continent between you and the white line. How dare you just keep whining about it? It's not going to work. They have cameras and sensors. You can't argue with the umpire while you're driving around at 200 miles an hour. Yeah, this isn't baseball. Exactly. Um, uh, okay. I do appreciate a good John McEnroe tantrum, though. Yeah, I know. Me too. Uh, I mean, we got one from Lewis. Uh, okay, sprint recap. Uh, we kind of talked about it. Uh, what's the first one? Here? Ch uh, Checo uh, wants to prove that he is on par with Max, uh, but just isn't. He really no. isn't. He really isn't. Like, uh, and I, he got his a excuse good... after the fact that he said, "I didn't see Max." What's up with that? Yeah, I, I mean, what? Apparently, it is hard to turn their heads or something like that with the Hans device and the. C I don't know, uh, but you've got wing mirrors. Yeah, he was clearly alongside, and like, Checo gave it a good shot off the line. It was a good setup into turn one and two, but he went super wide in turn one, and Max is like, "Oh, I'm just gonna go this way." And like, Max is lucky it ended up as well as he did, getting on wet grass. Like, that was that was fine, but yeah, that was he wanted to prove. He wanted to prove he was check he was as good as Max so bad and just like Oh, it well it almost went terrible. Any other driver, and I'm gonna include Lewis in this list after Spain twenty sixteen, uh any other driver would have spun off into the wall. Uh, so credit to for Max keeping it pinned in a straight line. Um I think maybe he's channel ch channeling Jeremy Clarkson and more power. Uh Great gamble by George. I assume this was you referencing him choosing to go onto Slicks at just the right moment. Yeah, I, I, he nailed it. Um, you know, car, car, the, both uh, Mercs were a bit out of position and out of the points, and he was like, yep, time to gamble to go on the softs. Uh, yeah, and or you go softs or mediums. I forget. Either way. I think, he, I think he went mediums. Either way, like, put the tires on, and it was very clearly, very quickly that that was the right place to be for especially that kind of, like, five or what five six seven position in the uh in the sprint like max was just um uh, what did my friend send with send me about max it was hilarious um that max just fucks off into the distance is like really how he <laughs> races that sprint race and it, it really was like it, it was i mean it obviously helps that like hulkenberg was slowing down prez was like i'm just gonna bide my tires until hulkenberg's tires go away and then easily go around him but even once Perez got clear, he was not holding the gap to Max. No. Uh, I, I made the prediction at the very beginning of the race on the first lap. I said uh, that Max was going to win by 24 seconds. And until he pitted on the last lap, he had 24 second lead. And that's because yesterday's race, he, he won by 12 seconds. And I'm like, today's race is just a do-over of yesterday's, except longer. And clearly it worked. And there you go ridiculous we also had some more classic alex albon defending this is like my only sad spot of a drying track was because alex was doing a great job holding on to i think either p7 or p8 in the points in the sprint race until you know he had to pit and put he put slicks on but but he was doing some classic alex albon defending i, I think there's an interesting observation did related to that did sergeant get the new car this week i thought they would both have upgrades this week they didn't last week, so if they did this week, it's interesting to comment on his performance. I think that the upgrades that Williams brought kind of made the car 
easier to qualify, but it haven't really improved its race pace. And so Alex, who, because of the nature of the car, especially with its slipperiness on the straight line, he can defend, but he just does, still doesn't have the car, doesn't have the pace to attack. And so they do a great job in qualifying, and then they hold everybody up. Yeah, and I think we, but I think we talked about it on Canada, was like, you know, he drove like 20 laps perfectly at the end of Canada, because if he locks a tire in any one of those, like, Alcon's coming around. So, like, the fact that it's more just classic Alex Albon defending of, he, he knows exactly how to drive that car and keep everybody behind him, no matter what your DRS or your situation is, until you're on a drying track and you have somebody on softs charging through, and yeah, then then it's then it's a little bit harder to, to defend, but still. And the... uh. The Norris-Leclerc uh, battle was great throughout that race. That was pretty fun to watch. I have to say, I completely forgot about it, and I cannot remember a single thing about it. Well, that's because like, they were battling over scraps than like anything interesting. Thoughts on the sprint? Ah, you know, it was a very sprint race. I hate sprint races. I don't... They, they don't... I know what they're trying to do, and I think if you are a in-person attending attendee of the race... I think they add a lot of value because it's fun because you get to see a real race and it's great and you maybe get it for cheaper because you didn't pay for the full race because you want to watch it at home. Um, I, I don't understand what it's adding to the sport. It's very strange. Like, that everybody was like, yesterday sprint race shows that sprint races could be amazing. It had nothing to do with the sprint race. It had everything to do with the transitioning track. It, had, pfft, I, I, it was fun. I enjoyed it. I'm not going to like, oh, I wish I hadn't watched that. That sucked. Um, but it, it doesn't add anything. Like, can we get rid of sprint races, please? Or for, if you need to do something with it, can we do something different let's change this up drive the track backwards drive the drive the track backwards put them in f2 cars put them in a spec car I, you know limit the horsepower you can't go more than 20 miles an hour i don't really put, know put them on, put bicycles. on bicycles yeah <laughs> exactly something uh, because it's ridiculous and i think it's just it, it's the fact that it is uh, like per my point about 12 versus 24 seconds it's just a race and it doesn't add anything to it uh yeah i i thought it was a great race it was very fun to watch given the changing changing uh conditions it would have been interesting if that had been a normal race weekend and that was quali to see like how that would have changed it would have been a very similar qualification to canada situation um but i think it would have been fun if it had been the race that it happened in too i don't but like we didn't have that weather today so eh. uh but yeah it was it was a good it was a it was good for a sprint race but it's still kind of like what's the point of the sprint race yeah, no, it's very strange, very strange. So, especially compounded by the by the qualifying shootout shenanigans too. Just as a whole do over process, very strange. Hamilton, uh, Hamilton did a great job charging back through the field in this in the sprint race because he started like 18th or something like that. He did. I thought he did. It shows that Lewis still has it when he's in a good mood. But that's always been Lewis's thing. Speaking of Lewis mood. not being in a good mood, let's talk about the race. Let's talk about the race. I, I love Austria. I think Austria is a great track. I love the elevation changes, and I absolutely love the track limits. That might be a bit of a controversial statement, but, like, if you want to go fast, keep it in the lines. Like, Do you like the track limits because the randomization factor of when somebody gets a penalty? Or do you like it because you actually think that the driver should be sticking inside those lines and, that's, and, and it would still be as good if they could if they put the wheel off to go into the gravel instead uh yes i still think it'd be good as good if they put it off into the gravel again i don't like necessarily the awarding of like all the penalties i'd prefer if it was a gravel trap but i do appreciate how hard that final turn double turn complex is that like they know it's faster to go over line but it's like thinking back to to bahrain in 2001 or 2002 sorry 2021 that one what is time? Uh, thinking back to where, where Lewis was like cutting turn four every single time to gain more lap time, like that to me was absolute garbage. Like, no, there are white lines. You stay within the white lines of the track if you want to race. Um, so I, I love, I, I love that. Like, hey, guess what? The final two turns in Austria are very hard. And you know, you look at who had like the very fewest deleted laps. Alonso didn't have many deleted laps. Verstappen didn't have very many deleted laps. If you want to, if you want to prove how good you are, keep it within the white lines. Because Max was finding a shit ton of time just by keeping it within the lines. It's true he did get a number of laps deleted during qualifying because of going outside the lines. Sure, but he didn't on race day. Uh, yes, uh, which in some respects is the one that matters. I I agree with you how good the track is. I love it. It's a fun track both to watch. I think it's a fun track to drive in games. Like it's it's got all the goodness in it. I think it's short enough that it actually produces interesting 
racing rather than just you know a long you know two minute track a two minute lap that just it, you don't get the repetition and the opportunity to revisit each corner as many times. I think it's great. I, I do what I think maybe we, if we're really lucky in 2026, we might get a sub one minute lap time. Um, That'd be but cool. we'll see what happens. But but you think like uh, like what you you go up to turn three, uh, and then Perez overshoots the corner, it's kind of takes them back in turn four. You get the replays of it, and then by the time the replays over, they're back doing it all over again. Great, exactly. Great it's track. great, fantastic, exactly. So much fun. Uh, it's a good argument for shorter tracks. Um, it makes me wish we kind of go back to Sakia. Sakia was uh, great. Twenty twenty again. Yeah, yeah. What was that? That was a sub sixty second lap. Yeah, I think time. it was like 54, um, 55 so. seconds. It was great. Yeah. Yeah, it was great. Uh, so yeah, I think they need to sort out the the track limits. Like, I was just reading an article before we uh, started this that um, Horner and Toto and some other people like you need to do something. Horner was advocating for um, uh, putting the gravel in. Uh, Toto was advocating for just either put the gravel in or make it just don't care about it. Let them take the fastest line. Who cares, right? At the end of the day. Well, that's yeah. No, I I care about that. I think it's. Because if you don't care about the track limits, what's the point of having white lines that dictates a circuit? Oh, cool! We're, I'm just going to drive in a circle and cut all these corners. Like, no, you have to have you have to have limits, and it's Be- up to because the- it becomes an adjudication of how far outside the white line the white line really lets you go. At which point, it just becomes the same problem again, and it's ridiculous. It'd be like if in the NFL, it's like, oh, we can let that catch count even though he was out of bounds because he did a really good job catching it. Like, no, yeah, he was out ridiculous. of bounds. Stick in the white lines. I, th- I I do think that the realization is that, that some corners they enforce it in, some they don't. Track by track, it varies. Like, they need to be draconian and absolutist about it across all tracks on all corners. There is no excuse on any corner. And it's because I don't know which corner it was, but you kept seeing them and they were going off it and it wasn't the ones that they were getting track limits for. Like, if you're going to do it, you have to do it consistently because I think that does not help reinforce for the driver that you need to drive inside the white lines. Yeah, I, the only exception I'll make is, like, there are some co- complexes, like the the one in Russia, turn one, two in Spain, of, like, the, if you need to bail, like, here's the way to go around the cone that's clearly slower and we're not going to penalize you for it. I think that sort of situation is fine. You might need to add something like that to turn three in, in Austria, just because, like, you know, there's a lot of people who go over there and then come back in. But I think other than that, like, but it has been a lot better since Michael Massey has left because, you know, we saw that, like, in the 2021 season, it was like, oh, the track limits at this track are the edge of the curbs. These, this track limits is the white line. Like, it varied track to track. And I 100% agree that it's like, just make it the white line. It's always the white line. You go over the white line, you get a demerit. It, it apparently used to be, per the commentators, uh, that it used to be leaving the track and gaining an advantage. And apparently in 2020, I don't know if it was this year or last year, they removed the and gaining an advantage part. Because I think that's where you would always get the, the negotiation was like, well, did they really gain an advantage? I, I can't rule. Yeah. Yeah. And that going back to like a 2021 in Bahrain, where Lewis was gaining like three tenths a lap by going over on Bahrain. But because he wasn't gaining an advantage while he was attacking with or dueling with another car... They were letting it go, and Red Bull put their hand up and said, he's gained like 30 or 3 seconds worth of lap time, or 3 seconds over with his race time over the last 10 laps. How is this not a lasting advantage? And I think they were absolutely right. 100% agree. 100%. Uh, next item on here is uh, Red Bull does the right thing but throws away the laps led record. Yeah, uh, I totally understand uh, You know that safety car for Hulkenberg or came out super super early kind of in the the two-stop strategy what it looked like the it was what lap 14 or 15 and they were saying they weren't going to pit until 22 23 so i i totally get the hey we're going to stay out we knew we can overtake the ferraris but did did you have to you didn't have to you you could have you could have gone in on the second time around and, and got kept the laps led record going like but so i appreciate that red bull's focusing on what they need to focus on which is winning races and not superfluous uh, records but I was sad to see that go. And yet they let Max pit on the penultimate lap to go for fastest lap. I uh, swings around about there. Yeah, but you don't get points for leading laps. You get points for fastest lap. You get points for the race win. And, and I, I love Max overruling that and saying, nope, put, bring, it, bring me in. I'm Put softs on. I want this fastest lap point. Taking it off Perez. Yeah, I thought it was, I did credit to Red Bull for actually listening to the driver, unlike basically every other team that exists that doesn't listen to the driver. Did you watch the the gap to Leclerc on the, the last lap? <laughs> it was, it was hilarious. It's like, they're like, oh look, Charles is down to two seconds, but Max has got good tires. And then Max just goes, 
it, straight down the middle. It was like two point. It, well, he came out like three seconds ahead. It dropped to like 2.1 as he was weaving to warm his tires and charge his battery, which was hilarious to see. And then like it was 2.1 when they crossed the line and ended like 5.3. And it was just like, oh, wow, that's different. It was ridiculous. I, I was I was surprised that they let Max do that. And when I was watching, I was like, oh, my God, this is clearly about to go wrong. But no, he pulled it off and it was amazing. I don't think they let him do that if they didn't have the lead in both championships that they have. Uh so I also thought it was interesting that at one point during the race, Javi uh, uh, clicked on to uh, Charles and was like, hey, how do you feel about a three stop for this race? And Charles was like, no, no, absolutely not. Why would we consider doing that? And then meanwhile, Max three stops to a win. <laughs> because that's not Ferrari. Yeah, true. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you've got Toto Radio, and I'm not quite sure what this one's about. Oh, uh, did you not hear any of the uh, Toto Wolf radios? Uh, yeah, but he does that every other race to tell those that I'm sorry about the car because it's crap. Oh, but it it was more than that. It it was it was full on feisty Toto of like, yes, the car is crap. Go go push anyway. Like, I'm sorry we did a bad job or shut up about the penalties and drive the car. It was very much like a like Toto was angry on the radio this time around, and it was fun to watch. Was he angry at Lewis for being a whiny teenager, or was he angry at the team? Because I think the team has done a great job. They, they have clearly brought some upgrades. We'll talk about those in a little bit. Like, like the car is not as crap as it was. So, per your point earlier, did they get not get enough time to do the setup right? Like, I don't think they can. They can. They can't lean on the argument that the car is crap and undrivable to put up with a whiny driver. Well, I think they also uh, Crofty was talking that there might have been some sort of uh, Lewis Hamilton brake issue. Yeah, he was saying he couldn't get the car to slow down. Yeah, and they were they were using brake magic on, like, corner four or something, which we all know how well brake magic works out in... Yeah, that worked well for Lewis last time he tried it. Yeah. <laughs> so, when I heard that, I was concerned of, like, what does this mean? So, yeah, I, I, I don't know. Uh, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if, like, Tuesday or Wednesday we get an article of, like, here's how broken the Mercedes actually was for some odd reason. You will get the, the race debrief that Mercedes does a really good job with their race debrief. They answer questions and they cover like the dumb stuff and then they explain them. And usually the answer is like very boring at the end of the day, but it is it's it is often very interesting. I feel it, it feels honest. Um, I, I do feel like Hamilton was extremely whiny. Um, I mean, I yeah, he got a penalty, but he should have just driven inside the white lines and pff, just get on with it. Like what happened to cheery Hamilton? I like Lewis Hamilton. I like whiny Lewis Hamilton because it shows he cares. Because if he's not whining, he doesn't care. So I'm happy he cares again. But this is going to sound strange. I get he's whining, but like also get on and drive the damn car. Yeah, like, that's true. I, I get that it's broken. I, I get it. I understand that. But like, there's, a, there's an aspect there of instead of... Here's the difference. There's whining and then not driving well. And I feel like he could whine and then put his head down and get on with it. Like... Max tends to do that. Max will complain and whine and then go off and just drive the car to the best of his ability. Lewis seems to get caught in this trap of he sees that he can't get the results that he wants out of the car. E.g. maybe it was he thought he could get a podium, right? I don't think he was looking for a win. But because he sees that slip away, he's like, well, what's the point? I can't I can't I can't achieve my goal, so give up. He doesn't like make the best of a bad situation. Yeah, that's fair. Uh, I thought Ferrari screwed over their number one driver, and by that I mean they screwed over signs. Oh, they absolutely did, and it is ridiculous. The the time and energy that Ferrari spends in making bad strategy calls, treating their drivers with contempt, and not maximizing what they have is ridiculous. It is like if I if I was anybody except Fred Vasseur because he's new and he gets a, you know a pass for a little while. I would be terrified at Ferrari. I'd be terrified of losing my job. I'd be terrified of losing my the good people who work with me because they'd maybe like to go to a team that can convert. And I'd be terrified about losing my number one driver, uh, Carlos Sainz, who is clearly better, more consistent. And I think this is this is going to be the, this is the controversial part. I think he's faster than Charles. Not on his best day. Charles Charles on his best day is is pretty good. He just needs to be a little faster on Saturdays. That's that's Carlos's problem because Carlos goes in front of Charles on one lap pace then he's not stuck behind him going, yeah, I clearly have more pace. When we're watching going, yeah, you clearly have more pace. And then when Ferrari bungle a four-second pit stop under the VSC, he's not sitting back there waiting like, why are we double stacked? Like, uh, What was the thing that happened towards the end? It was like, uh, oh, that was it. 
I think I want, was it, I don't want to come in and they're like, okay, stay out. And then they're like, no, box, box. Oh, that, that was Charles. If we're going to extend the stint, okay, copy. Oh, yeah, that was Charles. Okay, yes. copy. Next lap. Box, 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 box. It's ridiculous. And the contempt that they have for Carlos is ridiculous. I, it's going to sound really strange. Carlos made a mistake going to Ferrari. He should have stayed at uh, McLaren. Because I think he would have, he would have relished and and grown as a driver and performed he may not have had made as much money he may not have had the results but he would have been treated with respect and he is not getting treated with respect i still think he made the right move going to ferrari only because only because it's a stopping a stepping stone to being able to go to another good team i i'm just thinking of what has mclaren's performance been like in the last couple seasons terrible that yeah terrible that if he's back there then it's like oh carlos signs is He's a he's a mid driver in a in a mid car, and now we're sitting here going, Carlos Sainz is probably the better Ferrari driver at this point in time. And while Ferrari might not be able to convert a world championship, they are at the pointy end of the field at least. It was good for his brand, and it was good for his career from the perspective of perception. It was not good for his results. I I know he's gotten better results, but I actually think that if he'd not been at Ferrari, he could he. He could have bided his time at another team that was on the up, which it looks like McLaren might be, uh, and then use that to to convert to his um, his advantage. I just, I, I don't know. I, just, I don't want him to become abused like Charles has become abused. I think he's better than that. Yeah, I think so too. But it's also, I think if he stayed at McLaren, like, is he able to outdrive Lando? And if he's not able to outdrive Lando, his stock doesn't go up. I, I think he's in, because like what Charles was the wonder kid coming from Alfa Romeo into Ferrari. And here he is holding his own against Charles, if not making Charles look slow and foolish at some times and looking much more consistent. I think I understand what you're saying of like maybe things would go well for him if he was still at McLaren. But I think if you're looking either for like we talk about who does Aston throw in if Lance is gone, Carlos mm-hmm. is an option. Like, yeah, I, 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 yes, please. I think him and an Aston that's, that's driving could be pretty good. And it could be the Spanish Dream team. Yeah. No, I, I so I, I, I don't agree that staying at McLaren was right for Carlos, but like, he's definitely getting the classic Ferrari treatment at this point in time. Indeed. Uh, next item, it says, uh, Aston protests the race. They did. I loved him for it. It was, it was, they weren't protesting like a specific instance. They just protested the whole damn thing. It was ridiculous. And uh, the FIA claimed they were already looking into it. I'm not sure I believe. Yeah, uh, there was a uh, there's a photo I saw of, of somebody from the Aston Martin team walking through the pit lane with like a stack of paper in his hand of like, oh no, we're going to this protest and like, essentially it's like, look here here's like all the 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 things of everybody going over the track limits and it's like you didn't investigate all of these. Yeah, it was, it was ridiculous, and it did in the end benefit Aston Martin, who I think now are probably in front of Mercedes. Uh, F one standings, uh, Aston Martin, they're three points behind Mercedes, so they stay they stay a lot Still. more than touching distance. But they were they were they were a lot further behind on the initial results. I thought it was two points last time I looked. Like before I looked before the race, I thought it was only they were like one hundred and sixty two versus like one hundred and sixty four. But apparently they're just they're only a few points now, so. Uh... And, and meanwhile, uh, Red Bull still has double the next team. Oh, uh, I sent you the uh, the Karun Chandok tweet of like Max would st- Max would be leading the constructors championship all on his own. Uh, I think that returns to the point of does Perez still have a job? So uh, did the Mc- McLaren update gain DRS superpowers from Red Bull? Uh, this is this is if you watch the performance of Norris driving around with his upgraded car, and when he got DRS, he was keeping in touch with every car that he was behind. He kept behind the Ferrari and he kept behind the uh, Mercedes. Like when he had the DRS going, it was it was like it was like Red Bull superpower that it was just amazing. And I thought that was really interesting um, that they see. I, I don't know whether they lucked into it or whether they chose to adopt some of the designs from Red Bull, maybe. And they've net they've netted out that benefit. But I thought it was really interesting because as soon as he dropped out of DRS or he was in front of everybody else, it did not go well for him. Like, he still did a really good job driving that car. But that DRS, he was, like, staying half a second behind lap after lap after lap while he was in the DRS. My uh, my take for, for Silverstone is going to be that the Merce- uh, McLaren upgrades really weren't that powerful. Lando's just really good around Austria. I, I did spend half the race uh, chatting to my better half saying, like, is this because this is, like, Lando's track? Last lap, last lap Lando from 2020. 
um, and that that was really what it was, and the car itself was only marginally better? I don't know. Well, it's, it's all eyes on Piastri next week. Silverstone will tell us. Indeed. Um, I thought the other interesting last comment on McLaren is they just fired their technical director, like, what, two months ago? And somehow they, at least ignoring the previous point, like, the car seems to be going so much faster. Why did they fire him? Because clearly these upgrades were not from the new from the new guy because he doesn't start till next year. And so it was the existing team. I thought that there's this weird thing that keeps happening in F1. It's like, let's fire someone and then you still do well because of the things that they had put in place before they were fired. I mean, maybe this is one of those that the people underneath them were saying, hey, I think I have a good idea. And they were saying, no, I know best. I, I am the I, I am as good as Adrian Newey. And meanwhile, the, the next young Adrian Newey is sitting there going, no, I think we should do this. And now they're doing that. That bodes well for Saba slash Audi, uh, who hired him. Uh, one more thing on the topic of DRS. I, I, looking at the performance of the Red Bull DRS magic, it's amazing. It is properly fantastic. And I'm trying to work out whether Red Bull had noticed the ability of their lead driver, um, Max Verstappen, to take advantage of getting DRS at the right time, in the right way, and holding back. And that they for, therefore chose to design their car around a impressive drs ability and whether that's what's really paying off for them because i like I, it's interesting how well it works for them and then max unlike sergio perez is able to deploy that at the right time in the right way by using the right strategy i'm just it's just curious how well it's played out i think it's maybe some of their their learnings from the previous formula because you, you think of like how where they were lacking from the mercs in in the previous formula like they they didn't have the same top speed. So, yeah, they could hold through the corners. They could, but then, you know, you get to a straight or something. And even with DRS, they just they couldn't pull the Mercedes back in. And, and I wonder if, because if you remember back to, I think it was Saudi last year, or um, they made, uh, I think it was Nui made a comment of like, we realized in 2021 we needed a good top speed around this track. So, we've set up the car with a really good top speed. And like it, w- it was very clear that like this Red Bull, more than like some of the previous generations of Red Bull, is much more focused on how fast can we go rather than like what what like you think back to um, like 2014, 2015, where the Red Bull's the only one going flat out through uh, through cops at uh, or maggots and Beckett's at Silverstone, and now it's like oh well, what if we're just fast on the straights and uh, we're we're still good in the high speeds, but what if we're also just fast on the straights? I think that's 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 an interesting take because I, I yeah the the Red Bull has always been like it has the nim it's a nimble car it stays in the corners it's great but it never quite had the top speed especially when you hear about the rumors that came out I think yesterday or today about how Red Bull has petitioned to change the 2026 engine regs um, and Toto came out and said well they've been belly aching about this for a while and he thinks Toto thinks that it's because Red Bull have realized they can't get the engine to the performance profile needed to be successful. Um, the whole thing is it's uh, 50% battery power from the uh, kinetic energy store and 50% from the internal combustion engine. And apparently Red Bull's like, well, we think what this means is that your ICE needs to be really good and the battery's going to basically need to be recharged every five seconds and people are going to downshift in the middle of a straight and everybody thinks that this is related to that. And I wonder if your point about them making the realization about the analysis of the performances, you have to be good through the corners, but you need to, you don't have to be best through the corners if you can be amazing in a straight line. And they've looked at what this means in 2026 and they're like, oh, we've lost Honda and we've got to do this ourselves. And we're probably looking at a five to 10 year journey to build up that muscle and that ability to build a good combustion engine. Yeah, maybe. Uh, But then to quote Toto, the stopwatch doesn't lie. You know, yeah, yeah, but th- this, uh, I mean, this speaks to um, one of my other uh, sport interests of track cycling of, yeah, you can talk power numbers all day long, but at the end, the stopwatch is what people are measured on. And yeah, so yeah, it doesn't matter how fast you go through a corner complex if you have a slower lap time. Exactly. You, it's, it's, as always, it's the whole package. It's not just one thing. And also in this generation of Formula One, the cars are so big and so wide. Like we talk classic Alex Albon defending. Who cares if you can't, if you're faster through a corner, if my car's in your way? Indeed, I need those cars to be narrower. That's the, that is the, the last remaining item, I think, in terms of improving the on-track racing between they've now made them with the ground effects that they can follow closer. They now need to enable you to actually have a width that you can actually get a car past. And then Monaco will be fun again. 
Um, last item on the race, uh, I'll try not to wax lyrical about this for too long. Uh, Merc raids did work, Merc upgrades did not work. Uh, you claimed that they'd solved the problem and they'd made the upgrades. I have been vindicated. I was correct. Those upgrades were still not good enough. Um, and I think I think this makes a meta point about upgrades in the whole season and it's the paradox of F1. You can't just do upgrades. You have to get upgrades that are better than your competitors. But here's where it gets really messy. If you don't do upgrades, you will slide down the field. It's like you can upgrade all you want and spend all your money, but if you only move the forward at the same rate as everybody else, you doesn't you go nowhere. You just spent a hundred million dollars on getting a second a lap faster, but everybody else did too. Um, and I think this is just the paradox. It's 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 a blessing and a curse. I, I will. I mean, we know we have they have another upgrade coming for Silverstone. Yes. I would not be surprised if they brought upgrades for. What, it would have been Imola, Monaco, Spain, uh, Canada. And they knew Austria might not work out with these upgrades. And they just kind of threw it away. I Maybe. And the, the whole story within, the, within, the, within the, the paddock got changed because Imola screwed up their um, perception. Because they didn't get to try on a real track until it was too late. And blah, 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 etc. I, I can believe that. I can believe that. Uh, so... Shall we move on to spicy takes and rumors? Yeah, let's finish it up. Okay. Uh, my number one here is, uh, so Marco won't let Max race the Nürburgring because Max will take it too seriously. I think that this is a great PR opportunity. Toto should give us the race that we've been wanting and let Lewis and George ride, uh, drive the new AMG1 hypercar around the Nürburgring. It's a perfect PR move. You get the coverage of their fancy new car. We finally get the race between Lewis that we've always wanted. And... This is the one that's really interesting. It sets up Red Bull to have to go and do a Nürburgring race of the Red Bull hypercar between Perez and Max on the same track after the season has ended. I, I just think that they need to go and do this. I think it's one of those that, like, it's one of those, if if it works well, it's going to be like, oh, this is genius. But if there's any sort of issue, if they put it in the wall, then it's like, why are you taking this unnecessary risk with your drivers when you're three points ahead of Aston Martin in the Constructors' Championship? And who are they bringing in? Mick Schumacher? Mick, who's going to destroy, the, who's going to send them over the cost cap for the season because he's going to total the car? Hear, hear me out. It is a chance for Mick to drive a car at a race and get him back into F1 again. It is a chance to call up Alex from Williams and give him a real car and see what he could do. I, I think we should go one step kind of further on this. We put uh, Mick and Danny in the, in the hyper cars and the winner gets like the Alpha Tori seat or something. Okay, I, I can buy that. I think that's a good way of doing it. Yeah, yeah that, that works. The, the, the one lap shootout around the green hell for, <laughs> for the seat in Formula One. Exactly. Uh, I'm not sure this is that spicy a take. Uh, and you alluded to it earlier. Lando is just really good at Austria and McLaren's upgrade aren't amazing. I'm wholly subscribed to this. This isn't, this isn't spicy. It's Lando's track. He loves it. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I, yeah, it, it's, it's a little bit of spice. Um, I was thinking why we haven't had the spiciest takes of recent. And... Um, it's just kind of a boring F1 season. Max is just running it away is. with it. There's it, not a lot to like go crazy. It's boring on. on track and it's boring off track. We remember last year, it was, you know, there was, there was a bit of spiciness that was going on, but it really took off at mid season when Vettel resigned and Fernando screwed uh, Alpine. I'm waiting for that moment this year. This is the, the whole season hangs on the spots. The spicy rumor season. Uh, hangs on what happens at the mid-season. We need a good um, silly got... season, and hopefully we'll get we a, good a good silly, silly season. Silly season. Uh, last two items in the spicy takes, because of course this needs to be also the uh, fashion pages. Uh, I noticed that George has the non-pro iPhone. I was very surprised at this. Like, who does he owe money to that he can't spring another 300 quid uh, for the new pro? It was really interesting. It was in his color. It was in blue. But I, ha I have to question. He should... He's getting £8 million a year, apparently. So what's he going on with that? Well, I, I think, uh, uh, I mean... Eight million pounds? Uh, sounds like a bad deal. Ah, uh, yeah, you sent me that link. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we talked about this. Uh, where, for, as far as second drivers go, he's he's underpaid as far as second drivers go. Less than Perez, less than Signs, uh, less less than Valtteri, and he is managed by Toto Wolf. George, it's a really good deal if you take this. George, you still owe us for all that time we trained you. Yeah. Uh, you got to pay your dues. Uh, and then last in the spicy fashion pages is what what happened to all the Tete Nando and uh, Shakimilton Shaquem rumors? Oh, that like, was we terrible. We haven't heard anything for a whole week. Shakimilton, Shakira and Lewis. You need to, we need to come up with a name, right? 
it's the tornado tornando does shakira have a last name or is it just shakira like i'm sure she does on her passport shall we move on to the wrap up Uh, with crazy but plausible predictions for silverstone oh yeah uh yeah i I think i think mercedes upgrades are going to be successful again i think lewis lewis and george on a home track i think it's going to be good if you're mercedes are you having the discussion right now that when lewis is in front on the podium and George is right behind him and gaining on him because that seems to occasionally what happens when we get Moody Lewis. Do you really ask Lewis to move out of the way at his home track, a track that he clearly, deeply, passionately loves? Or do you just you just tell George to hold the station? I mean, I think they'll both be on the podium. I think it's going to be Max Lewis George. But but George is going to be behind him at like point nine on the last like six laps, and George is going to be on the on the phone saying, "Let me through. I've got more pace because I can get whoever's in the lead." Because Lewis will have punted off Max on T2. Whatever it is, the one That T2. happened once. Uh, yeah. Where do you think the Ferraris are going to be at Silverstone? I don't know. I'm very unsure about the upgrade because we've only had one race. Yeah, like... Because... If, if the Mercedes upgrade works, the Ferraris will be behind uh, the Mercedes. And then uh, I think Aston's bringing something. Like, are they... The, yeah, Aston's bringing something. So are they back to the second fastest car, at least with Fernando Alonso driving it? Uh, possible, but then we got to the whole paradox thing. Everybody's going to move forward, so nothing's going to change. I, I wouldn't be surprised if in qualifying we end up with um, with a Mercedes sandwich with Aston bread. Yeah. Does Prez miss Q3 again? I'm going to say yes. yes. Keep the streak going. Yes. Yes. Uh, let me add that to the list so that we can come back to that next year. Prez misses Q3. Exactly. Uh, okay. And then your last item is Red Bull will tie McLaren's consecutive win record. How far are they away from that? One. Oh yeah, they'll do it then. Yeah, unquestionably. Yeah, uh, it, it, it's ten races back to uh, Abu Dhabi at the end of last season, and McLaren's record is eleven. It's going to be interesting. I, they're definitely going to do that. Definitely going to pull off. Is it only eleven? It is only eleven because it's the MP44. Yeah. And so that wraps up another episode of Tinfoil Helmets. We're waiting for your feedback. Write into feedback at Tinfoil Helmets so that we can hear all of your conspiracies, your feedback, and your wants. And tell your friends to rate. Like, listen, and subscribe to this world-class podcast.